he has a lower target. So he has a higher target, so he can better match it. And uh, Bitcoin and Next actually has a, another twist on this formula. Um, for example, um, uh, Next uses the, the, the time on the right side of the equation, uh, and Bitcoin uses a uh, coinage, uh, so-called coinage variable, which is um, basically how long has a specific coin has been sitting on the blockchain without moving. So as the, as the coin gets uh, uh, older, uh, it's aging, uh, it, uh, uh, it gets a better, it makes you a better chance to, to get uh, the next block. And um, once you get the block, you consume this coinage, so you kind of get back to the queue. And this is a smart algorithm to, to get uh, everyone gets his turn. So when you, when you get a block, you consume your coinage that you used for, 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 uh, for getting your role to produce this block, and then others can come, and others get a higher chance to, to produce the next block. So it's, it's kind of a fair uh, system. So uh, these, are, these were the basic uh, uh, post-mining formulas. Uh, they're still in use. Uh, Bitcoin is not that popular nowadays, but uh, it's still strong. Uh, Next is, is uh, now creating our door complex platform and they have still been using the same formula so no one really uh, destroyed this uh, with some kind of an attack but uh, the community all agrees that they, are, they, they have uh, sewer weaknesses and um, sometimes it gets to a very heated argument of, of is a proof of stake uh, safe or not uh, well I will let you judge that, but uh, show you how, what, I, what kind of uh, weaknesses they have. Uh, for example, there is this nothing at stake problem, which, uh, like in, in Bitcoin, in proof of work, uh, like I said, uh, it, economically you have to mine on the black chain because otherwise you're wasting your resources. If you're burning electricity trying to get this block, you're wasting the electricity. In proof of stake, you don't need uh, to add a proof of work element, it's free almost to generate these blocks. So when there is a fork, once this fork happens, what is your best strategy to, to which, which block to mine on? Basically your best strategy is to mine on both blocks, it's free. And, and you never know which one's going to be the, the official chain, so you, you're better off uh, actually mining on both chains to, to keep your options open. But if that happens, never going to happen a consensus. If there is no consensus, then there is no um, system to work with. But uh, uh, some, some say that this is only a theoretical argument because it never happens. Uh, and it's not a good argument because something never happens doesn't mean that uh, it's not a valid concern, uh, especially when we're talking about uh, a, a system that runs an economy of, of billions of dollars. Uh, the other problem is the long-range attack. It's a specific attack. Since it's free to generate these blocks, and they don't have a cost that you burn when you generate the block, and, and your likelihood of generating the block is proportional to your stake in the previous block, it can happen that a year has passed, and you have a year-old block. At this point, Maybe you were one of the founders of this, uh, this uh, token and you were at some point you were holding 10% or 20% of the tokens. You already sold that long ago, but at this point, a year ago, you had 20% of the tokens. So what can you do? You can create a whole chain of a full year. It basically costs not much. With a reasonable computer, you can create it very easily. And you can create this alternate reality. Where, where nothing that on the real chain happened have happened, but you still have your coins and then you buy a car now with the coins. So uh, it, it's, you cannot do this with proof of, state, proof of work because during the year there are so many proof of work elements added into these blocks that for you to come back to here and create a valid block, it would cost you millions of dollars of, of electricity. But with proof of stake, you can do it. So actually it can be exaggerated more by you can do a, a long-range attack with posterior corruption that means that uh, you can buy up Q 
keys from people who already sold their coins. So they have private keys to their uh, token holdings, which they already sold, but a year ago they had token. At this point, today, for them it's not worth anything, right? Because they already sold their coins. But the private key for you, if you buy these for cheap, you suddenly come up with, with a lot of private keys that had value a year ago. And then you launch this long range attack. So it's, it's actually easier to do than, than, uh, than um, just not, the, not, not only the, the, own, the own creators of the token can do it, uh, someone can just buy up these keys. And there's also a third problem, it's called stake bleeding. Uh, actually, during that year period, a lot of transactions have happened, actual real transactions signed by real uh, uh, people owning the coins, and now you start collecting all these transactions, that, which are valid transactions, you come back to the moment a year ago, and you start creating blocks, and you put these transactions into the valid transactions into the blocks. And since there is usually a, a fee that you can get for, for a transaction, it's not just, not just a mining fee with the, you know, the Coinbase transaction, but you get a little bit of a fee for each transaction. So suddenly you give these little fees to yourself. So imagine how much fee you can accumulate during a year when you are the only person making all the blocks and taking all the fees for yourself. So you just start aggregating more stake to yourself and you create more power to yourself to generate the next block. So you can do some weird things with, with theoretically with this. Uh, uh, so the question is, is it just theoretical? Should we talk about it or not? Um, it's maybe for the next time. Um, Solution attempts. Well, Ethereum uses uh, punitive strategies uh, like uh, Slasher. If you want to mine on both chains, uh, punishes you. So you won't be doing that. But that's an economical reason. And some people criticize it that uh, purely economical reasons are not uh, good enough to, to protect the system. Uh, because someone might want to destroy your, your system and not think in economic terms. Uh, and some others use checkpointing. A peer coin uses checkpointing, for example, to to they don't let block uh, blocks to change uh, after a point in time. So for the long range attack, they say that I don't let anything change from 720 blocks ago. And after that, we are uh, uh, before that it's fixed, right? So so I don't let anything change, but. Uh, Introducing checkpoints is, is uh, you know, uh, criticized a lot because who introduces the checkpoints sometimes? It, it's always an authority. So if we have an authority, then, then, then why did we do this all this peer-to-peer -peer network, all these complex uh, algorithms and stuff? Why don't we just use our bank accounts if there is an authority that uh, tells what's the official state? We had that before. So the question of, of, of uh, checkpointing is, is uh, debatable. Uh, so I just, I just try to summarize proof of stake now. Uh, the, the positive, the pros, uh, it doesn't use the energy that the proof of work uses. It uh, puts the rewards, the mining rewards, into the hands of those who own the coin and so-called stake, should be stakeholders, actually, uh, rather than the miners who don't care about work. There is no arms race in the hardware uh, of ASICs. You don't have to buy this hardware. Uh, from China, uh, and it's more difficult to launch a 51% of an uh, attack because buying 50% of the coins is uh, uh, more difficult than renting some hash power for, for, for a while. So you, someone can wreck Bitcoin by renting hash power for an hour and um, overpower the network, but to buy 51% of the tokens to do the similar thing with POS, um, you would push the price up so much that it costs you a fortune to get those tokens. And when, when, once you've wrecked the system, your tokens that you just bought for billions are now worthless. So imagine how much cost it has to, to wreck a, a proof of uh, stake system. Um, there is a cons, and that is that, uh, like this checkpointing element that I mentioned, and um, SPV nodes uh, have to trust their um, so the, the, the blocks the block headers don't have uh, weight anymore and uh, so if someone sends you a block header um, 
you don't know if it's actually the long, it's, it's the heaviest chain. You have to trust. So the light nodes have to trust the, the one who sends you the block header that it's the actual block header. Because otherwise, uh, uh, he could send you anything. It would be proof of work sake, basically. So um, both means that, that, that these proof of stake systems are so called weakly subjective, not objective like Bitcoin. In Bitcoin, someone sends you the, you're a new node, you just enter the network. Someone sends you the history, the, the full header chain up to this point. Uh, and you, you talk to like seven nodes or whatever. If from one source, only one source, you get the correct chain, you will know that that's the correct chain. The only requirement is that you are talking to one node in the system who is honest. Um, opposed to these weekly subjective proof of stake chains, uh, imagine yourself, you, you, you join the network and you're trying to get a history. And you get conflicting information from the different nodes. Uh, there is no weight in the headers. So it's basically who is telling right and who is telling wrong. Your only chance would be, is, for example, go with the majority. So if 51% says, this is the history, then okay, I, I go with the history. But then, what about an eclipse attack, where, where the, the attacker um, uh, uh, goes in circle around you and uh, creates like um, 20 nodes that all say that this is the official history, which is a wrong history, and then you say, okay, it's 20 people saying it, so uh, I go with the, uh, that, that version of history. So, so weak, weak subjectivity is weaker than the objectivity of Bitcoin, much weaker. But uh, Vitalik Buterin wrote an article about how I started to love, how I learned to love big subjectivity. It's a very popular article where he uh, states that it's just as good as, as uh, proof of work. Uh, so it's, it's, it's for you to decide. Um, I would like to move on to another uh, um, big area of consensus algorithms, which is much different than what had been said before. But uh, what happened is, is uh, in the 80s, that was a popular movement to, to study Byzantine fault tolerance systems. And this was uh, about um, computer parts that um, you wanted to make reliable. So computer parts can always fail. And, um, uh, you wanted to make sure that the, the plane doesn't crash or the nuclear plant doesn't blow up if, if some parts fail. So what you wanted to replicate these parts and, and to make sure that if one fails or even a minority of them fails, the system still works. And um, this launched this, this uh, um, movement and uh, research and a lot of protocols that try to solve this problem that if some of the parts fail, then um, I still have a working system. So it's, it's fault tolerant in the sense. Um, the, the, the framework they work in is that uh, these uh, parts have an identity. Uh, it's similar, that, you know these, um, uh, like Facebook and Google, they all, like, their storage systems are, are actually distributed in the sense that uh, Google stores the data in many places around the globe, redundant, and everything. And, uh, and uh, so one fails, one node of Google fails, it's totally fine. They have master slave. Algorithms worked out perfectly. But uh, these nodes are all known. So Google knows that I have these 10 nodes. And the identities, the IP addresses, is totally known uh, in these systems. Um, so that's the framework for the BFT uh, algorithm, and the, the only um, and, and they can fail. Any node can fail in any way. Um, it might not send some message. It uh, uh, might send a wrong message. So, so Byzantine failure. When you hear that uh, someone is talking about Byzantine failure, is sort of a synonym for bizarre failure. Anything can happen basically. Uh, the, the 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 part can stop sending messages. Can start sending messages that don't. Uh, follow the protocol, might fake something, uh, might have a virus and doing crazy things. Do you have no uh, uh, knowledge of what it, you can do anything basically. 
Uh, to model this problem, this is when they came up with the Byzantine generals problem. You will always find it in textbooks. That is just an illustration of the problem. When they had these uh, uh, Byzantine generals trying to attack a, a city, and uh, they can only, basically they can only overtake the city if uh, they all have consensus and they can agree on uh, if they should attack or not. If if part of them wants to attack and the other part doesn't attack then they don't have enough resources to, to take over the city, so they all die. So it's very important for them to be on consensus even if they will attack this morning or, or tomorrow or at some point in time. What you want to add, and uh, oh, this 80s had this popular movement of creating Byzantine algorithms for these generals to agree on, on, uh, on a consensus when to attack. Yeah. From a consensus like that, you expect like two things. If, if the generals come to a decision, uh, and they, if they come to a decision, then they all should agree on the decision, and they all should know that they agreed on the decision. So that they should know that tomorrow we attack, and everyone knows that tomorrow we attack, so everyone will attack. And there is another uh, criteria, criteria, liveliness, that uh, the system should actually come to a consensus at some point, that they know that we should attack or not attack. These are the, the actual uh, trivial requirements. Uh, and uh, many people studied this, this uh, uh, field. And there are two very important, uh, uh, actually it's pretty easy to, to prove both. Uh, the FLP impossibility is that under the full asynchronous assumption, there is no solution even if one node is failing. The full asynchronous assumption is that, that uh, we don't know anything about the network. It can be totally broken. Uh, and we don't know the order of the messages, how 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 they uh, arrive. It's like uh, you know, in internet, you don't have much uh, guarantees on the, on the on the order of the TCP packets. Maybe a line is, is broken for a long time. Um, and there is another theorem that says if one third of the generals or the nodes that participate in the system are Byzantine, then there is no solution, basically. Um, instead of proving it, uh, we can have an illustration uh, which easily shows it that this is the Byzantine problem for two generals. It's a simplified version. The B is the city, A1 and A2 is the two armies, and they have to agree on if they want to attack next morning or not. And basically one, should, one can say that I, we should attack. Did you get it? I, I suggest we attack. We don't know if the message goes through, but maybe it goes through. And then the other one says, okay, let's attack, and sends the message back. But at that point, he doesn't know if A1 has heard this message, so he will actually attack in the morning. Because uh, uh, maybe he wants to wait back for A to hear that, yes, uh, I got your message, so we will attack. So he's waiting, and nothing happens. If nothing happens, does this mean that the message was uh, captured and it couldn't go through? Or does this mean uh, that the uh, person doesn't want to attack? He, he cannot make a, cannot make a um, decision on this if there is no assumption that if the network can go down for any amount of time, no assumptions on it, then there is no good solution for, for there is no point in time where we can be both sure that the other will also attack. Uh, you can play it through uh, in your head. And um, that's for, for this reason that sh there are assumptions over the network. So every BFT protocol makes assumptions over the network. The usual assumption is that no one can take over the network in a large area for a long amount of time. And if they make such assumptions that uh, it's not possible, then they can do some weights. And if so, after some point, after some waiting period, I still don't have a message, and I can assume that uh, he's not, he did not send the message, and, and stuff like that. Um, but the theorem says that if, if, you can, if I cannot make any assumptions about the network, I cannot do, say anything. The other theorem was, was that uh, if one third of the generals are, are uh, bad, you can do nothing, basically. It's also easy to see because you, you read for, for like three players, and you, you just simplify the problem to one bit of information, like we attack or not, it's a zero or a one. Uh, so if you have three players, 
and 1 is 40, then P2 cannot actually tell if he is getting uh, 1 and 0 from the two sources. P1 says uh, attack, P3 says don't attack. At this point, he has no clue if P3 is faulty or P1 said 0 to P3 and 1 to P2 because P1 could be a uh, malicious node who wants to confuse the, the generals or the nodes uh, to and break consensus. So he could say one, 0 to P3 and 1 to P2. And then P3 would be right to say 0 to P2. That's what he heard. So at, at this point, P2 has no clue what's happening. So uh, the system cannot work for three nodes if, uh, if one of them is faulty. And then you can generalize this theorem into to n nodes. And uh, if one third of the nodes is faulty or malicious, uh, they can uh, wreck this kind of uh, system. Um, so it's usual, every, every BFT algorithm that you will see will go with the assumption that one, uh, it's less than one third of the nodes is uh, malicious. Two thirds, at least two thirds are playing by the protocol. That's how, that's how they work. Uh, the way they work is that they do rounds and each round they do voting and uh, if the majority says the same thing, they proceed to the next round of voting and at, that, at some point, after waiting a period of times, uh, they can be sure that, that um, they came to a final uh, consensus and then they agree on the result. And once they agree on the result, they, um, they move on to the next... Uh, uh, you can use this for block selection. So this how it ties in to, the, to this uh, blockchain thing. Imagine that the, the thing is that we want to agree on is what's the next block. And there are several, like there is a fork. There are two different blocks uh, flowing around in the network. Uh, part of the network wants to put this block into the chain and the other wants to put that block into the chain. So we have a disagreement. So let's have a vote. Which, one is, which, which block is the official block? And then some people um, say this one, others say that one. Maybe like 52% uh, says this one, 48% says that one. Okay, then what do we do now? Then these algorithms uh, give you an, uh, a protocol on how to proceed based on these votings and get to a point where, where you agree. And they have like, Tendermint has four cycles. Propose, pre-vote, pre-commit, commit. Uh, which they go through after the fourth cycle, they agree on what, what's the uh, majority wants, and then they go with that. I will not go into all of them, because they are slightly different, and we could spend all night here. Uh, but uh, in the 80s, the Ruft and Paxos was a very popular ones. And in 1999, there was the PBFT, this is called Practical Byzantine Fault Tolerance, and, and most of the today's protocols go along with the PBFT version because they, they were much faster there. It's a more efficient algorithm. It was a big uh, uh, thing in 1999, this uh, invention. And these uh, Hyperledger, Ripple, Stellar, Tendermint, they will use some form of this uh, PBFT protocol, some, some version, uh, spin on it. And, uh, uh, often people think that Bitcoin is, a, is, is sort of a Byzantine uh, fault tolerant algorithm and uh, you hear this, you, you sometimes even read it that uh, Bitcoin is this uh, BFT algorithm but uh, it's actually not true. Bitcoin is not a BFT. Uh, I mean, you never see this uh, blue thing that's a myth that I'm trying to debunk. Uh, Bitcoin is not a BFT algorithm. So B BFT is totally different. Uh, um, why is it different? Uh, here's the, the comparison. Uh, the whole uh, problem setup is different. BFT is solving a totally different problem than Bitcoin. And uh, a lot of people don't realize this. That uh, in the Byzantine model, you have limited number of players with known identities. The UNL is a universal node list. You will always find this with, with Ripple and all the other algorithms. You have a universal node list. Which are the players in this game? Which are the nodes with IP address? You have to be able to talk to them directly. Uh, Byzantine has eventual consistency that was mentioned in the previous uh, uh, talk that uh, once the Byzantine uh, nodes come to a conclusion that this block is the next block, then there is a finality on that. No one can reverse that. Uh, so unlike Bitcoin, which is probabilistic in nature, yeah, I know if it's six blocks, confirmation on something, 
then I can kind of get a probability that it would cost like a million dollars to revert the blockchain back to this point. And uh, so it's very unlikely that someone would revert the blockchain back. So I can give the car keys to this person and he takes the car from the car, car salon. So, but there is no finality in Bitcoin. There is no point in time in Bitcoin where you can be 100% sure that it, is, it has just happened. But, but Bitcoin doesn't need an ID. A new user just downloads the Bitcoin software and launches it on his computer and he is immediately part of the Bitcoin network. He doesn't have to go to Ripple and ask for universal uh, you know, ID or, or, or some of these uh, systems that have uh, this list. Uh, so it's a totally uh, different uh, problem that it's trying to solve. The, the Satoshi Nakamoto was trying to solve a problem where um, anyone can join. It's a totally open network. And that's, that's why he did not use technologies that were present in the 80s already. Uh, it's like a new trend to use these BFT algorithms. And uh, the, the target for these BFT algorithms is basically usually uh, big banks trying to create a clearing a system between them or companies, uh, closed so-called permission blockchains where, where actually the players know each other. They don't trust each other fully, but they trust each other to some extent.